So that's you. And that is your idea. You build an application to get your idea out to the world. Traditionally, you had to go through hopes and hurdles to get your idea out to the world. It would take you days, weeks, or even months to order and receive a server to host your application on. And eventually, once you get a server to host your application on, you were dependent on that server for the rest of your life. Your application and your server were married for life. You wrote code that could only live on that server. It couldn't live on other servers. And if you had to scale, you would scale resources on that server. Heck, you even stored session information on that server. If the user was in the middle of something and your server crashes, everything that the user did until that point was lost and they had to do all of that all over again. Your app was tied to that server for life. Fast forward many decades to today. We're living in the world of high growth SaaS startups that see user growth from zero to millions in a matter of few months. Going from an idea to execution only takes as much time as you need to develop the code for it. Provisioning and hosting can be achieved in a matter of hours, if not minutes. Most cloud platforms today can provision servers and other resources in a matter of minutes. And most of the time, you don't even need to worry about provisioning a server. With PaaS and serverless technologies, you can simply write code and push and you're done. Today's platforms are expected to be up 99.999% of the time, meaning there is no time to take down the application for any reason whatsoever, meaning there is no time to take down the application for patching servers or adding additional resources or scaling. For this to happen, your application needs to break free from the underlying infrastructure. This way you can host your application anywhere you want, be it on-prem or GCP or AWS or Azure. And that's known as portability, to be able to run the same app on different environments without having to change the source code of the application. When it comes to scaling, in the past, you had to take down your application to add additional resources to your servers. That was referred to as vertical scaling. Today, you provision more servers and run more instances of your application. To summarize, modern applications need to be portable and as such must not be tightly coupled with the underlying infrastructure. They should have minimal divergence when deployed between dev, test, and prod environments to enable continuous deployment and must be easily scalable by spinning many instances at once and must be suitable for deployment on modern cloud platforms. In order to achieve this, your application needs to be developed, keeping certain principles in mind. About a decade ago, engineers from Heroku put together 12 factors that needs to be considered when building modern applications. And these are known as the 12 factor app. And that's what we will see with examples in the rest of this video. These are also documented at the 12factor.net website. And before we proceed, don't forget to subscribe to our channel as we release new educational videos every week. I'm going to first list all of the 12 factors here. And in the rest of this video, we will understand each of these principles through a very simple and easy to understand example. So the first one is to have one code base. The second is to explicitly declare and isolate dependencies. The third is config to store config in the environment. Fourth is backing services to treat backing services as attached resources. And then the fifth is to strictly separate build and run stages. Sixth is to execute the app as one or more stateless processes. Seventh is to export services via port binding. Eighth is to scale out via the uh, process model. Ninth is to maximize robustness with fast startup and graceful shutdown. Tenth is to keep development, staging, and production as similar as possible. Eleven is to treat logs as event streams. And twelve is to run admin or management tasks as uh, one-off processes. So let's begin with uh, a very basic example using Python and Flask uh, web framework. Uh, we will display a simple message in our browser. So we create our app in the app.py Python file. This file will handle all incoming and outgoing requests within a, our web application and serves as the entry point for our simple uh, Flask app. It uses the Flask framework for hosting a web server and simply prints the message welcome to CodeCloud on the page when accessed from a browser. So super simple and straightforward. 
Now, as of now, your code is only in your laptop. So let's see what the first rule in the 12 factor app mean. And the first rule is about having a single code base for your application. So you have users now visiting your website and users are requesting for more features. So you bring your friends along as additional developers. And now everyone is working on their own development environments, but on the same code base. And uh, they're all copying their code to a central hub whenever ready. Now they're stepping on each other's toes, working on the same files at the same time and creating conflicts. And you need a solution that can help collaborate. And that's where Git comes in. So Git helps all developers to work on the same application at the same time and collaborate efficiently. Now everyone installs and configures Git on their machines and that's going to help in easily pulling the latest code from the central hub using the git pull command and they add their own changes and push it back using the git push command. And the central hub is a cloud-based platform that serves as a central location of all code. So git is the underlying technology and GitHub for example, is the publicly hosted Git-based central repository of code where you can configure projects and organizations and users and define different access for different users. So some other similar platforms are GitLab and Bitbucket. Now, currently we only have a web application. In the future, we may have an order processing service or a delivery service. And one of the practices followed in the past is to have a single code base and all related applications and services under it. Now, when you have multiple application services like this, you no longer have a single app. Instead, you have a distributed system. And as per the 12-factor app, multiple apps sharing the same code is a violation of 12-factor. And it should be separated into its own individual code bases. However, within each code base, you will have multiple deployments. The same code base will be used to deploy to dev or staging and production environments. That's how it should be set up. Let's look at the second rule in the 12 factor app. And this is to explicitly declare and isolate dependency. So let's see what that means. Now, as you may have noticed, we installed the Flask framework, a Python web application framework prior to writing our code. Therefore, it is essential to install the Flask Python framework in our local development environment before beginning development. Now, this is just one dependency of our Flask web application. But as the application grows, we may end up with many additional third party uh, dependencies like this. So a 12 factor app never relies on implicit existence of system wide packages, meaning you cannot assume that the dependencies such as flask in this case will exist on the system where you will be running your app. So this rule in the 12 factor app recommends to explicitly declare and isolate dependencies. So let's see what that means in our context. Many applications have multiple dependencies that must be installed prior to running the application. In the case of Python, these dependencies are typically listed in a file named requirements.txt in a specific format as shown in the example provided. Now it's important to note that the version number is specified after the package name. Without specifying the version number, different developers may install different versions, leading to inconsistencies when the program is run in different environments. For example, a developer may have installed one version of Flask during development, but by the time it is deployed in a production environment, a newer version may have been released, and the operations team may install a different version, which could cause the app to not function as expected. In the end, the pip install command will install all the dependencies listed in the requirements.txt file during the build process. And typically the requirements.txt file is located in the root directory of the project. So that clarifies how to declare dependencies. But what about isolating the dependencies, which is the second part of this rule. So say we are working on developing two separate services or separate applications on our laptop. And what if one app requires one version of Flask and another app requires another version of Flask. Now it is a best practice to create an isolated environment for our application that includes all necessary dependencies. Now, different programming language ecosystems provide different approaches. For example, Python has a concept of virtual environments. With Python virtual environments, we can create an isolated environment for each application with its own versions and dependencies. This ensures that no external dependencies interfere with our application and that the same explicit dependency package is consistently applied across all development staging and production environments. With the requirements.txt file and the Python virtual environment, we are able to define requirements and isolate dependencies. However, what about tools that the application relies on that are outside of Python's dependencies? Let's say the curl uh, command or any other tools that are dependent on the system. How do we factor those tools and configurations 
that are outside of Python's capabilities within our dependencies. This is where another more universal approach that works across all the different programming languages can help, such as Docker containers. Docker allows us to run application in a self-contained environment that is isolated from the host system. It is a more efficient and reliable way to manage dependencies. And so for the rest of this video, we will stick to a Docker-based solution. So here we have our application code. Here we have the requirements.txt file and with the list of dependencies and we now have a Docker file to package the application with its dependencies into a Docker container. So the first line here creates an image from the Python base image, then sets the right working directory, then copies the requirements.txt file to the working directory and then installs the dependencies and then copies the application code into the image and finally defines the command to run the application using the CMD instruction. Now by running the docker build command, we build an image and by running the docker run command, we run one instance of our application. Now if you are new to docker, I would recommend checking out our free docker for beginners course on CodeCloud using the links uh, given below. You'll learn with hands-on labs using our interactive learning environment by working on real systems and servers. The next factor is about config. However, we're going to jump to concurrency and processes first and then come back to this one as that works better for our flow of explanation. So number eight in the 12 factor app is uh, concurrency. So far, we have containerized our application and run it as a Docker container. This executes one instance of or one process of our application. And this instance of application is able to serve several users. But what happens when we have more users visiting our site? We discussed earlier that we could scale up the resources vertically by increasing the resources to the server. However, we're going to have to take down the server for it and it's going to cost downtime and we're going to ultimately hit a maximum limit on resources that could be added for that server. But with new servers accessible within a matter of minutes, we are able to provision more servers and spin up more instances of applications today with great ease. We can then have a load balancer in between that can balance the load across the different instances of the application. However, for this to work as expected, we must build our application as an independent stateless app. In the 12 factor app, processes are a first class citizen. Applications should scale out horizontally and not vertically by running multiple instances of the application concurrently. Uh, the application itself should be built keeping this in mind. 12 factor processes are stateless and share nothing. Let's see what that means. We have decided to add a new feature to our app to show visitor count on our website. Every time a new visitor visits our page, we'd like to show the total visitor count like this. For this, we update our code to include a visit count global variable and increment it each time a request comes in. And that works well when we have one process running because the visit count is stored in the memory of that process. When we run multiple processes, they all have their own version of this variable stored in them. And as such, it displays different numbers for different users, depending on which process serves those users. The same is true for other details as well, such as user session information. When a user logs into our website, we store certain session information about that user, such as where that user logged in from, when the user's login expires, etc. This session information is needed on the server to keep that user logged in. But if this is stored in the process memory or locally in the file system of that process, when a future request of that user is directed to another process, the user may be considered logged out as the session information isn't available there. Now there are load balancers that are session aware and can redirect users to the same process each time, and this is called uh, sticky sessions. However, that is still going to be an issue if for some reason the process crashes and all uh, locally stored data will be lost then. Which is why 12 factor processes are stateless and share nothing and sticky sessions are a violation of 12 factor and should never be used or relied upon. Which is why we must not store anything in these processes. Instead, it should all be stored in an external backing service. This way, all data and session information is stored in a place that can be easily accessed by all processes. And it doesn't matter which process a user is routed to, it's as if all requests are handled 
by the same process as all processes now have access to the same set of data. The external service could be a database or caching service like Redis. So we modify our code to store visit count to a Redis DB. This change now allows us to run as many instances of our application as required while ensuring we store nothing locally and enabling all instances to point to the same count. So let's look at number four, backing services. So we integrated Redis as a caching service to our app to store the visitor count. There may be other similar services such as an SMTP service to send emails and S3 integration to store images. And all of these are backing services and must be treated as attached resources. What does that mean? Let's take the example of integration with Redis. Redis is an attached resource for our app and irrespective of where it is hosted, maybe locally or in a cloud environment or maybe a Redis managed service, wherever it may be, it should work without having to change our application code. You shouldn't have anything in the code that is specific to a locally hosted Redis service or a remotely hosted Redis service for that matter. We should be able to point our app to another instance and it should just work. So the next is config. As you may have noticed, our Python code includes hard-coded Redis host and port values. This presents a problem when deploying the application to different environments such as production, staging, and development. And as each environment may use a different Redis instance requiring changes to the host and port values. This is not considered a best practice as it can lead to inconsistencies and errors when deploying to different environments. To ensure that our environment configurations are separate from our main application code and under version control, we will keep them separate. We define a separate file named .env and store these in them. Python automatically loads the data defined in the .env file as environment variables to the app. We then fetch these from the environment variable in the code. The 12-factor app stores config in environment variables. This allows us to use different configurations for different deployments, such as uh, for testing, staging, or production environments. And additionally, it makes it possible to open source the project at any time without the need for any code level changes and without exposing sensitive configuration information to the public. Number five is build, release, and run. One of the recent changes pushed resulted in a typo in the message shown in the browser. This needs to be fixed ASAP. How do we roll back the recent change without really having to push another commit? Now in this case, since the code base is small and the issue is only a typo, it might look easier to just push another commit to the code fixing the typo. And we need to do that, of course, at some point. However, in larger and complex environments, you may not have enough time to push such changes and wait for it to get rebuilt and tested and deployed. This is possible if we have a clear separation of build and run phases. So let's first walk you through the different stages of a release cycle. Now the 12-factor app uses strict separation between the build, release, and run stages. So let's see what these stages are first. So the current workflow involves the development phase where you write your code on your laptop. This could be on your favorite text editor like VS Code or PyCharm. And now the code in text format is not good enough to be run. To run it as an application by the end user, it needs to be in an exe format, if you're familiar with Windows or a binary file in Linux. This could also be a Docker image as it is in our case. And converting the code from a text format to a binary or executable format is known as building the code. And that's the build phase. And there are several tools available such as Python has the Python setup tools or in Java, you have the Maven or Gradle um, and similar tools. And you usually have a build script that invokes these tools to build the application. And in our case, we simply use the Docker build command to build a Docker image for the application using our Docker file. Now, once built, the executable along with the config file for its environment together becomes the release object. Remember, we had different config files for different environments. So a combination of the executable along with the configuration becomes a release object. And that's the release object in the release phase. Every release should have a unique release ID. This could be a release with a release version such as v1, v2, v3, or it could be a release with the timestamp associated with it. So it's easy to recognize when it was created. Now, any minor change in the code should create a new release. And so the typo in our code base should have created its own new release version. And finally, you have the run phase where you run the release object in its respective environment. So the exact same build is used to run in different environments 
And that ensures that we have the same code base running in all different environments in a consistent fashion. Now, any minor change in the code will result in a new build process, resulting in a new release and a new deployment. Now, by clearly separating our build and run phases, we can effectively manage our build artifacts and deployments. By having a distinct build phase, we can store our build artifacts in a designated location, allowing us to easily roll back to previous releases or redeploy a specific release as needed. And this improves our overall ability to manage and maintain our software. The strict separation of build and run stages is a key principle within the 12-factor app methodology. In previous steps, you may have noticed that accessing our Flask web application was as simple as typing the URL and port number in a web browser on your local machine. In this case, it's 5000, and this is because Python Flask framework listens on port 5000 by default. Now, if we were running uh, multiple instances of our application on the same server, we should be able to bind the port to other ports on the server, such as 5001 or 5002, etc. And other services may have similar port bindings configured. For example, Redis listens on port 6379. Now, our app exports HTTP as a service by binding to a specific port and listening for incoming requests on that port. Now, unlike traditional web applications, the 12-factor app is completely self-contained and does not rely on a specific web server to function. The next one is disposability. The 12-factor app's processes are disposable, meaning they can be started or stopped at a moment's notice. Earlier, we talked about scaling. 12-factor app should be able to scale up to provision additional instances when requirement increase in a moment's notice, in a matter of seconds, ideally. For this to happen, processes should strive to minimize startup time, meaning you shouldn't rely on complex startup scripts to provision your app. The same is true for reducing instances when load decreases. Processes should be disposable when no longer required. The 12-factor app's processes should shut down gracefully when they receive a sick term signal from the process manager. So let's see what that means. When the docker stop command is initiated, docker first sends the sick term signal, and after a grace period, if the container is not stopped, docker sends the sick kill signal to forcefully terminate the process running inside the container. So why the two signals? We want to allow the application enough time to shut down gracefully. Our application may be processing requests from hundreds of users at a time. A graceful shutdown allows the application enough time to stop accepting new requests, at the same time complete processing all existing requests. This way, users who are waiting for a response from the app are not impacted. For this, the app should be able to handle the sick term signal to avoid any unexpected data loss or resource leaks that can occur if the process is terminated forcefully with a SIG kill signal. Here is an example of the Flask application accepting the SIG term signal and then terminating the process. The next one is dev prod parity. Earlier, we talked about three different environments where the application will be deployed. The dev environment is where the application is developed by developers to test changes during the development phase. The staging environment is where it is deployed to be tested against a production-like setup. And prod environment, of course, is where the application is hosted to be accessed by users. Now, traditionally, it would take changes built by developers in the development environment weeks or even months to go into production. You had one set of people write code and another set of people deployed it in a production environment. And you probably had one DB used in dev, such as a light database like SQLite and another one in prod, such as PostgreSQL. So there is a time gap for the time it takes code to go from dev to prod environments. The problem with that is there may be other things changing in the app from the time that it was developed to the time it goes into production that might affect the functionality of the change. There is a personal gap where the ops people deploying the change has little to no knowledge of the new changes, resulting in making it hard to identify issues caused by the new changes. And there is a tools gap where different tools used in different environments may lead to unexpected consequences uh, when deployed in production. Now, this is where the 10th principle of the 12-factor app comes in. It is about the parity between different environments. The 12-factor app is designed for continuous deployment by keeping the gap between development and production small. And the 12-factor developer resists the urge to use different backing services between different environments. 
So with continuous integration and continuous delivery and deployment tools, today we are able to reduce the time it takes for changes to go from dev uh, to production environments in a matter of hours or even to a matter of minutes in some cases. The developer who writes code should also be involved in deploying and watching it in uh, production environments. And with tools, uh, we must aim to keep the same tools as much as possible. With modern tools being lightweight and containerization, tools like Docker, uh, making it easy to set up development environments, this shouldn't be hard to achieve. Let's now talk about logs. Now, our application outputs certain logs about the process uh, starting the port it's listening on and every request that comes in and is served by the server is logged as a separate line. So the logs would also capture any errors in code and this way we can troubleshoot issues if there were some failures. So traditionally applications followed different approaches to storing logs. One was to write the logs to a local file named log file or something like that. The problem with this approach is that since we are living in the world of containers, the container may be killed anytime and the logs are lost. Moreover, the application is coded to write to specific log files on the file system, which is also another problem. Now, in other cases, applications try to push logs to certain central logging system like FluentD, while centralized management of logs is encouraged. Tightly coupling specific logging solution to the app itself is discouraged. So we do not want our app to be stuck to a single solution. So in this example, the code where we actually send logs to this specific uh, logging provider, this is uh, discouraged. Uh, so the 11th principle in the 12th factor app is about logs management. A 12 factor app never concerns itself with routing or storage of its output stream. We store logs in a centralized location in a structured format. So the 12 factor apps uh, must not try to write to a specific file or be tied to a specific logging solution 12-factor apps must write all logs to its standard out or to a local file in a structured JSON format that can then be used by an agent to transfer to a centralized location for consolidation and analysis purposes. So all logs must follow a structured format as it will make it easy to query and analyze. Now, ELK Stack and Splunk are other good examples of centralized logging solutions that can be considered. The last and final principle in the 12 factor app is about admin processes. So this is how our setup looks like right now. The Redis database stores the count of total visitors and say for some reason we realize that this number is inaccurate or that we wanted to reset it, we need a way to get into the app and reset the count as a one-time operation. Now this is a one-time admin or management task that we will have to perform using a script like this. And we may have similar tasks such as to migrate databases or fix specific user records, etc. The admin processes principle of the 12 factor app methodology suggests that administrative tasks should be kept separate from the application processes. Specifically, it recommends that any one off or periodic administrative tasks, such as database migrations or server restarts, should be run as a separate process or application. However, it should be run on identical systems as the app running in the production environment. In our example, we could spin up another Docker container to connect to the same Redis database and run the reset script and to reset the numbers. And then it ends. The admin processes principle of the 12 factor app methodology recommends that administrative tasks should be kept separate from the application process and that they should be run in an identical setup and be automated, scalable and reproducible. Well, those are the 12 factors. So make sure you check your app's structure and operations against these 12 factors. Ensure you have just one code base tracked in revision control with many deploys to different environments, explicitly declare and isolate dependencies, store config in the environment, uh, treat your backend services as attached resources, strictly separate build and run stages, execute the app as one or more stateless processes, export services via port binding, scale out via the process model, maximize robustness with fast startup and graceful shutdown, keep the development, staging and production environments as similar as possible and treat logs as event streams, and finally run admin or management tasks as one of processes. In the upcoming video, uh, we will talk about how the 12 factor app complements cloud native computing. So be sure to subscribe to our channel to get notified when the video is out. If you like the video, don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. 
If you think this video is going to help colleagues or friends, don't forget to share it uh, in your community. Thank you very much. And until next time, goodbye. Thank you.